Good day, everyone, and welcome to Breaking Boundaries. I am your host, Talumba Katawala, Employee Brand Manager at Technip Energies. On today's episode, we have to welcome Karen Tietze-Fresh, Head of Analytics and Pilot Plants. Karen is joining us from Southern Germany this time, from Frankfurt. The unraveled passion for scientific research and the curiosity to explore wonders of chemistry helped Kaden acquire a PhD in chemical reaction engineering. Now she leads one of our most innovative labs. I hope to learn more about her role and how she breaks boundaries and pushes others to come along. Hello Kaden, how are you doing today? Fine, thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Ah, great. It's great to have you. I'm so intrigued with your job. So you're the head of analytics in our Frankfurt unit. Can you tell me more about you and how you are here today? How did you get there and what is it that you do? Yeah, um, I was always curious about um, different facets of science and how the world functions. So I was always passionate about math and also chemistry. I was especially fascinated how these small molecules can influence the whole environment and I can't even see them. So this is, was basically the, the trigger um, why I also started chemistry. In my case, it was more uh, called molecular science, but in principle, it's chemistry. The good thing about that studies was that I could choose during my path along which kind of chemistry I want to perform. So it's more in a biological path or more in a technical path. And um, along the way, I decided from step to step. And now I'm here, the head of the uh, lab in Frankfurt, doing chemical reaction engineering. I have this great image of you as a, I'm picturing you as like a little girl dreaming about becoming a chemist one day, you know, maybe in a tiny little lab coat and, uh, you know, dreaming of working in a real laboratory. And, and now here you are actually living your dream. Is there anyone who nurtured that uh, while you were growing up, you know, the love of science or that recognized that you had this natural inclination for it? Yes, definitely. Um, I can remember the long walks. My, my parents want, wanted to walk with me really long distances. And there we did always some calculations. And we were exploring the world, like which tree is it and so on. So I was really interested in nature and doing some calculations in between to that it, that I don't get bored. Yeah. So somehow this triggered me for my whole life. So I was at this time um, really interested in science and I'm still am. Oh, wow. Wow. So uh, uh, so your parents obviously nurtured that. So is someone in in your family also a chemist or is there a no no not really they are different fields chemistry is something yeah well i i loved in math and i always like to do quests and sudoku and uh, i'd like to have everything in place after you have some some questions and this was the reason why I did the studies because I was also in a position that I could do it so my my parents didn't tell me what to do I was able to choose freely and this was then quite straightforward for me ah sudoku yes wow I I don't think I've ever finished a game <laughs> so so basically your job now became a sudoku game so was it a natural choice for you did you know that you were going to follow this path or did you have something else drawn out you know, in, in this field, but in a different industry? Did you did you know that this is where you were headed? No, not at the beginning. I was choosing chemistry because I was interested in chemistry. But honestly, at the beginning, it was not 100% sure that I was ending up in chemical reaction engineering. So in a technical path. At the beginning, I thought more about going in the bio-based or biological um, mm -hmm. area. But during the way, um, it, yeah, it felt natural to go more in a technical part, more in a physical chemistry, from physical chemistry, more in technical chemistry, and then in reaction engineering. So, principle, this is all connected, but it was always a path which went for me in the in this direction. So, okay, you have a natural inclination, but were there other things that you might have considered and said, well, I'm not good at this and I'm not good at that, so I'm going to do this instead? Yeah, in principle, 
uh, everything which is connected to languages uh, and yeah things like that is um <laughs> it's not doesn't feel really natural to me so uh, i was always quite clear that i go into the science area whether it's more in the chemical or biological one this can be um yeah chosen on the way but it was quite clear that it won't be some spanish or french or <laughs> english studies <laughs> right yeah, so and, yeah a doctorate takes several additional years to study and to complete and it has to be something you're fully um committed to yes. um so what made you pursue a doctorate was it like Uh, an interest of yours was it something related to your career ambitions um what what made you take that take that decision to invest in a in a, in a phd yes uh, so during my master thesis um i was thinking about that a lot and um as a scientist i i choose a scientific approach so i did two uh, field studies with myself so i did two internships one in a scientific area for physical chemistry and one in industry uh, for chemical reaction engineering at BASF and uh, i even pursued the after the internship my master thesis at, at BASF so i at least had a glimpse of knowledge what it meant to be at industry and after that I decided to do some more research in the academia but long term I want to be in industry. So um in principle this was my my decision making point when I did these two internships and the master thesis and I had the knowledge of academia and industry and even my PhD was intersectional so I was also sponsored from some companies so I always had the co uh, contact to companies and also academia and i really like to work in the intersection area so between mm -hmm. science and engineering between academia and um industries so i really like to have the contact of both worlds uh oh, that's great yes. and and what was the hardest part about that you know once you finish your masters i guess you have a desire to get into the your field and do things but what was what was the hardest part about deciding to pursue furthermore in academia yeah um Actually our professors some of them are really stick to academia so they probably haven't never seen some industries and they were really harsh about doing some um research out of academia so they said that it's not really research it can just be done in university but I still decided to go in industry because I felt that I need to know what's happening uh, in industries before mm -hmm. I still do some three to five years phd time and maybe stuck then my whole life in an area where i don't want to be so i really needed to do this to to check whether industry um is suitable for me and therefore even if they wanted to me to stay at university to do my master thesis i decided not to and it was a really good choice afterwards so i really learned a lot how uh industry function how i function how i i'm working with other people in different areas and uh, yeah 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 so it wasn't just you investing in your in your academic qualifications but just the learning process and interacting with both worlds and yes. and, and still being academic about it too. yes 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 <laughs> so why did you, why did you choose the energy uh industry what what attracted you to work at technic energies but actually as a chemist it's not so far away to work in lab but the topic was uh, important to me so um before um i did this um position i have now at uh, technic in the lab i uh, was in a large research organization at the beginning i was doing some networking again the intersection between politics and industry and academia and afterwards i was um leading a group about biopolymers and there mm. i got into contact with this um sustainable chemistry and recycling and so on and i was really fascinated because for me it's also really important to, to pursue uh, sustainable topics and i also did some uh, seminars about innovation and there i met a colleague now of mine and she was telling me about this company and honestly i didn't know much about technique before 
but when she was talking about it, I was telling me why not? Why don't I look have a look at it? And mm -hmm. I was really lucky because there was an open position. So uh, the former head of the lab was retiring and they were looking for someone who will guide this group and lead it into a more sustainable chemistry and do it on a modern way to, to guide this group. And yeah, well, at the end of the day, I had the job and I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> um, I cannot miss this opportunity to ask you this question because you're literally the first uh, <laughs> female scientist I speak to. So I obviously I have to ask you, the female labor force participation rate in Germany is around 56%, but women make only less than one third of scientists and engineers in the country, so 33%. Do you feel responsible, like, like a role model for the younger generation or for all women in this sector or in your field? Do you feel responsible to represent and do you wear this lab coat with that in mind? Definitely, it's an important topic for me that everybody has the same right to do science. But for me, it's not important whether you're male or female. And I'm in the lucky position that it was never an issue for me as a person. But I certainly know that there are issues for this. And so I'm really happy if somebody has questions about this and ask me, how do you do it? Or I'm feeling like... It, certainly, I'm feeling like a role model in some areas. Of course, I'm a uh, PhD, I, I'm the head of the group, I'm young, I'm female, I'm, it's not typical, but still I don't feel like it's something special. Mm. I, I'm qualified for this position and I'm really, really in a good position that I can really do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, it's also very important to have a heterogeneous team a male and female, some university researchers, some industrials, some young graduates, some experienced professionals, and they all can contribute together to get better results and outputs. So if everybody would be the same, uh, there would be no new input. So everybody yeah. would be the same. And in science and also in other discussions or topics, it's really important to get different sides of something that you can choose the best one. Yeah, for sure. No, you, that's a good point. And also, I mean, for me, Working with you, I would feel like, you know, I would let all the technical stuff to you and I would bring all the language skills I have. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's why we need diversity. You know, yes. we can't both be good at everything, you know. No. And we don't have to. <laughs> we don't have to, exactly. So in 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 when I think about um a job position like, like yours or a field like yours, I always think that, you know, those people will have a much higher IQ. And that's an assumption that I make, <laughs> okay? Uh, and that you wouldn't have these challenges on gender-based discrimination because people are more logical. Is that true? No. In principle, no. we're all humans. <laughs> we all work the same. We all have our bias. Always when I'm telling the people that I'm starting really early to work at six or seven, that there's an 80% chance that I will be asked, and what is happening with your children? And I was questioning also the, my male colleagues and nobody was asked that. So there is still some uh, gender related questions, mm. um, but it didn't influence my, my path. And of course I, I can only um, do that as a team. So uh, my husband is involved, my parents, my friends, my neighbors and so on. So we all, team up together so I'm helping them they are helping me and this is how this can function and this is also this uh, my first experience in the leadership was after my maternity leave of my second child and um, well my boss was not really convinced that I can do this but my uh, other colleagues were teaming up for me and were convinced that I can do this my first leadership role for this bioresource group and while I did it, it was one of the largest groups of this research organization, and I think I did a quite good job. So it's not just the fact that you are a strong-willed uh, person, but the fact that you're surrounded by people that believe you in you and your potential and willingly support you to, to get where you need to be. So yes. you, couldn't, you couldn't have done it alone? No, definitely not. So now I'm curious that looking back at your whole career, can you tell us 
who were your heroes? Who were the people that you were looking at and and following in their footsteps or or admiring their work ethic, um, whether you know men or women? But um, I'm looking more at you know like I f- f- aspiration wise, who were the who were the people that you were looking at and trying to mirror and trying to emulate their style and their way of doing things into your own life? Real models, I don't have. I don't have this one person who I look up to. But there are many people I can learn from. So, for example, my professor at my PhD, he had three children, and uh, I saw them together playing in park. And after one hour, he was sitting with me on a desk and discussing with me about my PhD. So uh-huh. I was questioning myself: Can I also do it? Mm-hmm. Why is well, he's doing it? I can also do it. And since then, I, I'm trying to do things, even if it's yeah complicated, and you have to to juggle a lot. But in principle, it's worth it. So if I'm happy, I think I can also do my best on job and also in the family. Yes. So in 2020, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuelle Champertier were the first women to share a Nobel Peace Prize in science and particularly in chemistry. Um, what can you say about that, and how does that make you feel? So I'm really pleased, and um, that these are two women, and they got a lot of attention. But for me, it's important to raise this awareness. But honestly, I hope at some day we don't need to focus on whether which gender they have. We should yeah. focus on the on the science they have. Of course. Nowadays, we still have to focus on it because it's rare, but I hope in some years it's not rare anymore and we don't ha- need to discuss about this anymore and we need to discuss about the science behind. What would be, so then, your advice for uh, the youth willing to build a career in science and engineering today, considering, you know, all of the changes that we are experiencing in the industry and in our own human desires as well. Yeah, at the beginning, it's important to to know what you're interested in, but you don't have to stick at this all your life. So if you make a choice at the beginning, you can still steer during a path in which Mm -hmm. direction you exactly go. I think in principle, everybody knows a rough direction where they want to go, but all the way afterwards is also a lot of coincidences a lot of people who you meet and who influence mm-hmm. you and yeah it's really important the most important point is that you start at the beginning or that you start and on the way you can still decide um, which path you take yeah so have have a strong foundation but then be prepared to change course i guess right yes yes yeah. so Wish I would have known at the beginning of my studies that that would have left a lot of pressure pressure out of my decision. Right. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I know as well that you are an innovation coach. Yes. What is this exactly? Like, what is what is an innovation coach? What are you doing? And what is your recipe to make and obtain innovation from your team? Yeah. So. As an innovation coach, there are many perils to being head of a lab. So at the beginning, uh, for an innovation, you need ideas. You need plenty of ideas and you need to sort them and to focus on the the good ones. And the most important thing is that you're curious, but you also need to have applicable results. So this is the most difficult part. So at the beginning, uh, it's like you have a lot of ideas and then you need to channel them and to get really good ideas to really to the best idea and mm-hmm. then to get an application out of it and this is what an innovation coach does and this is also what a head of a lab does so at the beginning you try a lot of experiments and you narrow it down to the perfect recipe to the perfect process conditions that's also what we do in the lab and this should also be done in an innovation or in an innovation cycle that Mm. you have at the beginning many ideas and perform a lot of trials or a lot of discussions Mm. and at the end of the day together you can find 
one or two really good ideas which you can also apply them and innovation is not just generating ideas it's also the application of it and then it's an innovation when you can kind of apply it in, in economic scale oh so this actually reminds me of the first question when you were saying that it was your natural inclination to do that and then when you went to school you wanted to be in both sides in the academic and the practical side as well so this innovation coach is kind of the sweet spot for you right yes you get definitely. to do both yes definitely and as an innovation coach i'm not only active in my fields where i i know quite a lot but i also did some areas where i'm not an expert in and as an innovation coach, you don't need to know all the details because there you have a team which knows the details. You don't need mm -hmm. to know it. You need to guide them away how to come from an idea to an application to an innovation. And um, you can also learn a lot. So I also learned a lot about different scientific uh, approaches or different uh, fields of applications I was not aware about before. Fantastic. So what sparks your interest today? What what projects are you working on and what are we doing within TAN that kind of keeps this innovation blood of yours pumping all the time? What gets you excited? What makes you talk a lot uh, with your other friends about the work you're doing? What gets you excited nowadays? Yeah, in principle, it's this application. So I really want to do something. I want to see some biodegradable uh, materials uh, in the application some days. I want to, to see some recycled bottles in the shelves of the supermarket. And I want to be part of it. And I want to know that this bottle in this shelf is made with a technology I was um, helping with mm -hmm. or, yeah is helping with so all these discussions so this is what 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 sparks me what what keeps me going so i want to see the the results and i want to to yeah find new sustainable solutions for the future all right oh, that's that's the 10 way <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so do you have other things in the background that you're working on that you know we're not it's not on your linkedin page uh <laughs> You know, like hobbies and uh, secret talents you have hidden. You mentioned your that you have kids and your partner. What else? Should, what else should we be curious about? Uh, well, talking about sustainable, um, I'm also growing my own vegetables. So oh, cool. in summer we are, we have a lot of tomato sauce and tomatoes and. Um, yeah, some herbs, salads and so on. So, yeah, I'm really into that. My are you good at so it? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> continuously, uh, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, did, I started with a one uh, one square meter field in our old flat. And now I have a garden with a lot more. And in summer, we can more or less live from the fruits and vegetables we have in the garden. So and, it's and really nice. And how do you keep your two kids entertained? <laughs> Well, <laughs> beside the obvious, <laughs> what they all want to do, like uh, playing football, but I also really happy that they um, also like to have signs. So we, we also kind of sometimes dress up with our lab coats and our safety glasses oh, and do some cool. small chemical experiments. And I couldn't resist buying them some chemical uh, kit Aww. where they can do their own reactions so of course i'm happy if i can show them and i'm really pleased that both of them really like also the, the science and math as i do yeah mm. do they know what you do for a living yeah so they visit me once so actually they know it but honestly they think we <laughs> put in some flowers in some ni uh, liquid nitrogen and put a hammer on it and then it's <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but what they are always uh, telling the other ones is that that I'm doing plastic like plastic bottles so this they can understand and I also showed them some waste from the lab and right. they were really happy that that they could see it what I'm really doing and I think it's so in the basic they understood that we do some 
plastic bottles and they all uh, the one question was last week uh, why I'm doing something which is destroying the environment like the plastic bottles which we are not allowed to throw away and then I was able to say yeah well we are on the solution to, to recycle it and to get new feedstocks uh, stocks for it from uh, bio-based yeah. resources. Ah, oh, that's super cool. And then yeah. you're back to being a hero again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, this is our signature question. I, I feel like I know what the answer is, but I would really like to hear from you. What was your biggest boundary breaking moment? A moment that you look back and you say, wow, that left a mark on me. Definitely. Um... It basically it was two times. So one, it was the, the pregnancy and I was able to pursue my PhD in the eight months pregnant and to my defense with that, that I could do that. And that the other um, teamed up for me to get my first leading position, that I am good at what I'm doing and, and that they really believed in me what I did or what I do. Yeah. So these are these two really important moments in my my life, my career, yes. Wow. So you did your PhD during the, your pregnancy? Yes. And were you a high-functioning pregnant person? or Because you know there's different <laughs> types of pregnancies, right? And your yeah. first one isn't the same as the second one either. I was pregnant at this stage where I didn't have to go to lab a lot anymore. Okay. So I was already in the phase where I could write everything up and there were some experience left and I had some students who were doing quite a good job and they were doing some experience with me and or for me in the lab and I was supervising them from outside and I have of course some colleagues who were watching over them when they were in a lab. So they teamed up for me as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I was functioning, but of course there were some some restraints yes. yeah but uh, so that goes back to what you were saying initially that you really need a community of people to ensure that you know you're performing at your best because if you're like left out in your own I don't think you would have been able to no no that definitely so it or yes <laughs> definitely it's um it's that you need a, a team around yeah. you and everybody's happy to have a team who supports them in areas or in, in times when you need it Mm -hmm. And it's totally natural that you help the others as well and you encourage them to do what they want to do. Karen, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you and get to know a little bit more about Technip Energies and our footprint all over the world. Um, thank you for listening today, everyone. And in the future, we'll have more episodes with other inspiring people at Technip Energies, conversations on how they broke boundaries to become successful. And I hope that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that you're happy, joyful, and fulfilled.